Good evening, guys. So we, you're in Viking. <laughs> the new look. How's everyone doing? Yeah, tonight? nailed it. Yeah, good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, great. Love it, love it. Uh, well, good that we could uh, arrange a call on such uh, short notice. I think it's a uh, due time for a new uh, crypto sync. Uh, there's a lot of stuff happening right now. Yesterday there was a a meeting or a call or a chat between Jack Dorsey and Elon Musk. I haven't seen one second of that. Uh, and in general, I'm really uh, in need of a good sync. I'm not really um, paying attention too much the last two months uh, to the crypto market also because it's just too painful. So I'm I'm hearing some good things and I'm, uh, I'm just in need of an update. So I need to know what's going on. I'm only basically looking at the charts uh, technical analysis wise. Um, but I also think that I can use some, um, some a more fundamental update. So that's my aim for this call. Uh, Zoe, I heard that you have checked the um, talk between Jack Dorsey and Elon Musk. I Maybe have. you could again give a brief summary of what happened there, if it was uh, worth uh, the time. Yeah, sure. And, uh, I have to say as well that it looks like you're... Uh... I don't know. You're a happier and healthier person now that you don't spend that much time on crypto anymore. So I guess. Yeah, I'm 80% down thing. in my portfolio. But uh, <laughs> I wanted to say, like, uh, the last uh, uh, half year, uh, I think the first thing in the morning I often did was check my uh, my delta, right? My my portfolio. It was just a bad habit. And now I'm checking my uh, my aura ring score, my sleep score. And that's what you taught me from this thing. And my life right. is, is way better. Although I'm like 80% down, it, it's way more zen to uh, to check your RS score, your sleep score than your portfolio right now. So uh, thanks for that. But Zoe's right. You look a lot healthier, man. <laughs> I guess it really helps. I'm not sure. Did I look unhealthy before? <laughs> Do I just look no, healthy now? <laughs> I have a few you years older. You know? <laughs> well, thanks, guys. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, Zoe. So Jack Dorsey, Elon Musk. Um, yeah, we have to not forget, actually. I mean, we're talking about uh, uh, Jack Dorsey and uh, Elon Musk, um, but we also have to include Kathy Wood. Uh, she was part of the, the interview as well from ARK Invest. Um, so, yeah, I think it was quite an interesting interview um, to kind of sum it up with some of the takeaways I, I had, at least, is that um, as maybe some of the FUD that Elon Musk, I mean, undoubtedly brought into the, to the crypto media, um, he seemed very, uh, yeah, like bullish on, on crypto, as in just uh, he, like he, he made a couple of statements that would definitely indicate that he is still very much a supporter of Bitcoin. And he also explained a lot better um, what his actual thoughts were around saying that um, uh, Tesla would actually stop accepting Bitcoin. Right. Because that's something that I think caused a lot of a lot of movement and uh, frustration in the market. Um and actually, the basis for that was similar. Basically, what I think were already previously said as well is that just renewable energy is, is of course, the agenda of uh, of Tesla. And he put a lot of effort in that. And um, it was pretty reasonable, I think, for him to to kind of give that explanation as the fact that um, coal was used or like a very, very, very kind of, uh, say, dirty form of energy. Um, that's just something he couldn't support. But on the other hand, uh, SpaceX holds uh, Bitcoin. He personally holds Bitcoin. Uh, doesn't sell um, and very much believes that also, for example, Starlink uh, should or could play a role in making sure that kind of the unbanked or the people, you know, that don't have uh, internet access uh, should get internet access and all, all that whole story, basically. So it was a visionary aspect to it as well. Um, and uh, I very much also like to hear that uh, Jack Dorsey, uh, like Square, worked together with ARK Invest on, uh, on a paper uh, that supposedly there was actually kind of a lot of ideas between ARK Invest and, and Square um, that indicated that they're working together to kind of push the agenda of, of decentralized currencies. Um, so there's, there's a lot. And also, for example, using uh, excess energy. That was a topic mentioned there as well. So this energy thing came up multiple times in the whole conversation where there's a lot of energy wasted right now. Um, and that energy is actually energy that we could use and probably should use, according to them. And I think it's fair to uh, mine cryptocurrencies with, right? So um, there's a lot of, uh, especially for big players like this, um, I think more, maybe more in the realms of what Elon Musk is doing, uh, it could be extremely interesting and relevant to, uh, to do so, such things. And on this level, they're already thinking and working around that. So yeah, I think it was a very positive, uh, positive sign. I don't know if it's going to have that much market influence, though. I mean, this could be related, the fact that we're now in kind of a slight mm -hmm. uptrend again, but... 
could also just be something completely different, right? Yeah, uh, what do you guys think? Well, I didn't see the interview, but I'm more curious to um, to know if you think that Elon Musk actually gets the energy argument because I think that he gets it. Like, uh, like he got it like a year before, but because we can see that in uh, in tweets that are archived. Um, but now he made the whole case uh, recently, like, oh, Bitcoin, you know, it, it costs so much energy, and it, it didn't seem really genuine from my perspective. So I'm curious to, to see what you thought of that. So I'm wondering what makes you say that it's uh, that it wasn't genuine, because I, I think I can relate, but I'm still curious. Yeah, like like the the argument that oh, Bitcoin is not green, you know, the, the whole case that, that that Bitcoin is this this bad thing for the environment. Um, well, actually, it is not. And earlier tweets from him confirming, I think, also Jack Dorsey's tweets, they show that he actually did understood that. I don't know. Um, I think when it comes to when it comes to Elon Musk, there's probably more at play here than we know. Yeah, uh, yeah, I switched to space. Um, nice. There's more at play here than we know. Um, I, I mean, I think on the one hand, Tesla and Elon Musk is very dependent on the whole kind of energy or sustainable energy uh, debate. Um, so it's definitely, I would not be surprised if there's some political angle there uh, indirectly. On the other hand, um, even though Bitcoin is, um, it's not as bad as many people suggest. The fact that a large portion of the mining that was done in Bitcoin, or like a lot of the, the mining that was done in China, um, when it comes to the type of energy that they used, of course, was not the type of energy that someone that has um, renewables on their agenda uh, could and should support. So on that, on that side, I do, I do think that if he, and that, that's the argument I liked in this discussion, right? That's what he used. He didn't say Bitcoin uses too much energy or it's like, uh, you know, massive pollution mm -hmm. and yada, yada, yada. It was rather, no, it's actually quite okay. But the fact that it used a particular type of energy uh, that we probably shouldn't support that much anymore uh, was, was kind of a concern. And if that were, if, if Bitcoin would go to, what is it, 50%, I think? Maybe you remember this, Jorn? Yeah, yeah uh, 50%. Right, fifty percent renewable energy source. Then he would uh, he would be happy to, and he actually admitted and, and stood by this also in this uh, in this interview um, yeah. that he would open up uh, Bitcoin transactions again for Tesla. But you you know what surprised me what uh, what what I found really cool is that he he invested personally in Bitcoin and still holds it, uh, and Tesla obviously. But what I didn't know what was a revelation to me is that SpaceX also holds Bitcoin on its balance yeah. sheet. Yeah, that, um, I was really surprised by that. And what's even funnier, in a way, is that um, Elon Musk doesn't make too many personal investments. Like the, the, his personal investments have mostly been with his company. And I, I saw a tweet, and I, I I don't know if it's true, but it could be that Bitcoin might be Elon Musk's biggest investment ever after his own companies. Hmm. Okay. Oh. Okay. Interesting. Hmm. That would be interesting. But Jorn, I sorry, sorry, go. Well, it's the thing is like what I'm noticing and what is kind of the um, this is always the difficult thing, right? Like when Elon Musk says bad, like bad shit, then yeah. naturally the, my inclination is like boo Elon Musk. And now he's like a pro Bitcoin. And now my natural inclination, I, I'm noticing it. It's like, woo Elon Musk. But um, I have to I have to like add to what I just said as well. So that I still believe that um, uh, he, 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 he fucked it up pretty, pretty big time, you know, uh, on, on Twitter. And he definitely pushed, I think, an agenda that... Um, yeah, it, it's not uh, it's not the best for the Bitcoin and crypto e ecosystem. What he did in that sense, so I'm still very wary of everything he says in that sense. I'm still kind but, of like, uh. but then you, like uh, I think two things are very interesting. What uh, what, what surfaces here, right? Is first that there's so much more nuance to the energy discussion than any like when everything is raging hot, you know, in a bull market, and there's so many emotions involved, and then things crash. And all of a sudden, all the nuance is gone. But if you actually look at how nuanced the whole discussion is, you know, we just say with excess energy, but also right now in China, I, I read articles that there's um, actually, actually hydro plants going bankrupt because they have no one to sell their energy to. And then that brings so much nuance in the discussion. That means like, okay, yeah, we have enough energies. Like, it's not that we're overcharging the, the planet with energy. It's more that we're just not very efficient at it. And that's like that, that nuance, yeah. I think. Is uh, I, I think that nuance got kind of lost in the whole heat of the of the moment. Yeah, for sure. But regarding Elon Musk, like um, I, I think he's just slowly becoming just one of the crowd. 
I, I, I'm not, I'm not too optimistic. Like I think, okay, great. You know that he supports it. It's very good for, for Bitcoin, the asset, but we shouldn't forget that he went on the shield Dogecoin mm-hmm. on a, on SNL in a war, Wario suit, like super. Oh, Mario that was Wario terrible, man. Outfit. That was really terrible. But, but, but I've read, I've read too many messages of people that are not experienced investors that got caught up in the hype and they put way more into um, into Dogecoin that they could afford to lose. Yeah, but just if you look at his his Twitter profile, like all the comments in there, like I lost everything. Thanks, Elon. You know, my wife uh, yeah. divorced me. All this kind of shit. Of course, that's the, the fault if if you do, if you're stupid enough to yeah to stake all your money in that. But but you know still. He, 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 with uh, with great power comes great responsibility, right? And I, I think he he definitely showed his um, like his worst side in that in the in uh, the first yeah. first quarter of this year. That was also kind of my question. Uh, what Zoe asked, like, how does this change our image or perspective on Elon Musk? Because I'm pretty open about this. Before this whole shit show, I thought you know Elon, some kind of demigod. He's like creating all this shit, these companies, he's bringing the people to Mars, like, man, this dude really is, is on it. And then his whole Bitcoin thing, he really showed like a side of him that I, I didn't expect. Maybe his true self a little bit. And now again, okay, he says something positive and now we should, you know, embrace him again, like Elon, our savior, what, what, what's going on? You know, it was one thing that actually, I, 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 I've I had exactly the same internal debate, Niels. It's, uh, yeah. I, I'm thinking that the more I got into it, I also read his book by Ashley Vance, the, his, uh, the, his biography. Same. And yeah, me too. Um, he is kind of a trickster. Like in that book, you know, obviously he put the, the book put him in a very good light because there are also interviews with him. But he he is a trickster in a way, and like he he did these things with other with other technologies as well. Like he he scared the living hell out of people for AI, and he was while he was producing a solution, Neuralink, right? Like he does a lot of these tricks and the ah, more okay. you dig, the more you know, tricks you see, you know, it's, um, yeah, but, and that's, that's actually what I, I recently kind of came to, to realize, um, when it comes to innovation, entrepreneurship and all that, um, he's actually doing a really good job because overall, when you look at, uh, the history of the internet, for example, or like innovations in general, it's very often that multiple people or groups, um, across the world, like find the same innovation at the same time. But then when it comes to distribution, that's actually eventually the group or the person that gets remembered for it as the innovator. Right. So what I, what I really think Elon Musk, in, indeed, he's a trickster, but that's, that's just the game, right? We shouldn't blame the player. That's literally what everyone has to do. Like, and how far are governments not total, total tricksters? Um, so I think actually there's a lot to say for the way he does it. I think what, what, I, what I'm slowly trying to kind of, I'm trying to take off the glasses of either, um, judging him too positively or negatively based on what he says, but rather look at his actions. Um, because I feel that in when it comes to something as high stakes and as public as innovation on that level, it's rather the actions than, uh, than the words that should do the most. And he actually made a really interesting, uh, I think Vitalik Buterin in his conversation with Lex Friedman also um, mentioned this. I think, I guess they're in touch, Elon Musk and Vitalik, but um, is that Elon said something along the lines of, um, the most entertaining solution is probably the one that prevails. And he mentioned it again in this podcast, actually, he referred to Occam's razor, which uh, kind of posits that um, of all the options, usually the simplest one is the one that prevails. And he kind of twisted it to it's the most entertaining one. And that's that kind of uh, is part of his, maybe, I don't know if it's a vision, but it's it's at least one of his stances on Doge, for example. Um, so as long as it's entertaining, it's probably going to be, you know, attract the most attention and it's going to work. And I think he has realized this a lot, like years and years and years back um, in how he has approached his companies. And to be honest, it's, you know, it gets the job done, right? So is, is that Elon yes. or Fidelik who said that about the razor? It's Elon. So it's, it's, it's Elon. Elon's razor. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's true. It's Elon's razor indeed. Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> A little Trumpian, right? the most attention or the most entertaining that uh, that wins. That's a good point. I think a, a large portion of the reason that he became so big is just because of the entertainment factor as well. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's a it's a great story. He's a great storyteller as well. Elon, yeah, yeah, great character as well. Like he's just, is uh, how do you say that? Like a magnetic character because of his his quirks, his weirdness. Uh, is he a great story- storyteller? I think he's a bit awkward at that, to be honest. 
Yeah, yeah, but, but the, the, like story t- storytelling that doesn't mean per se that him the stories he tells himself ah, okay. or the, yeah. the grander vision he sells. You know, like let's we 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 become a multiplanetary species. We become a green, fully fully renewable planet or society. You know, like the, the big dreams he's selling. It's uh... yeah, he's definitely good at branding. Really good at at it. Yeah, that's true. Okay, and that was uh, then Elon. Uh, what about uh, Jack Dorsey? Because of course he is also a very powerful player in the scene of big tech. What did he have to say? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean to be honest, I'm not in um, as deep in you know following Jack Dorsey as I am with Elon Musk. That's simply because uh, what Elon Musk is doing with uh, Tesla and SpaceX is uh, particularly interests me. But when it comes to what Jack Dorsey said, uh, I think overall he's just. Um, he, I think he works more closely with Arc. Uh, and also uh, is focused a little bit more on um, actually doing stuff in getting Bitcoin somewhere, right? Like Elon Musk is more like sideline commentary in a way. Um, and maybe, you know, I mean, he is definitely invested. He has a stake. But on the other hand, Jack Dorsey is actually building stuff. Um, so overall, I think he iterated multiple times over the idea that it's, uh, he actually agreed with, it uh, doesn't really matter if it's the, um, if it's Bitcoin or the most entertaining solution that prevails, um, as long as we have like democratized finance, um, then then that's something that he is very, very uh, positive about. And I think it just made that stance multiple times uh, throughout the interview uh, and also aligned very well with uh, with Kathy uh, Wood uh, on some of the things that she said in in terms of the vision of the, the Bitcoin and also the, uh, the Bitcoin core contributors, for example, uh, that understand economical history and what their vision is um, and how both Kathy and uh, himself um, kind of realized also through conversations and a lot of learning experience from those people in the community um, that there's a lot of merit to the ideas that are going around there, but it also is quite difficult for people that come from a traditional financial uh, background to, uh, to understand that. That's at least how I interpreted it, that they were, um, yeah, they were still kind of amazed by some of the eye-opening insights they've had through that. And I get the feeling that for Elon Musk, it was a different thing, right? Because he came from X.com and PayPal. The whole payment thing is something that he has already uh, been in for, for quite a long time. Yet he yeah, he made that clear, right? In a tweet, like, I get money or something. <laughs> did, did you see yeah, that tweet? Did, like, I Bitcoiners, I do understand money. I made a lot of something like that. <laughs> I was like, Jesus he, he was definitely a little butthurt, I think, in that tweet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I even heard, I think, in a Telegram chat earlier today, I saw something about decentralized uh, social media platforms. That uh, They spoke yeah. about that. Is that true? Um, actually, I didn't catch too much about that, but maybe I missed that part because I was uh, I was distracted, or because I did have it, of course, on uh, twice the speed. Um, mm. But uh, no, I don't remember. I don't remember that part actually. Um, so it's definitely worth looking into because I've, I've read it online as well that he Jack Dorsey apparently is working on decentralized uh, uh, social media platform. I, I did hear rumors that um, that he has been well. I, I, he has tweeted a lot about that he's thinking about decentralizing Twitter. Yeah. But that there's there's obviously a lot of obstacles. But uh, I yeah. follow Jack Dorsey quite a lot just because he's um I, I I can I can I think he's one of the most important people in Bitcoin right now if you look at the West, and it's just because of the cloud he has and also the he shares the vision. I I know he's been visiting Africa a lot and I think he's also aware of the the financial opportunities and equality it can create in Africa. So he's been doing a lot of businesses there. He invested in a couple of fintech companies there as well. Yeah, that was cool. He was, uh, it was actually quite interesting. Sorry to, to interrupt, but what he mentioned is that he was at that time, um, I think he was in either Ghana or Nigeria uh, himself uh, and also uh, said that he was like operating there a lot. It, it seems to be, maybe you can tell a little bit more about that, Jorn, because I didn't know this. Well, I, I, I just know that he's been, um, he's been scouting a lot in the areas that I really like, like the, the, that, that I think are good for, for humanity as well. It's decentralization, it's Bitcoin, it's creating equal, uh, financial equal, equality in Africa, or at least equal opportunities, you know, or equal access. And uh, the, the, I think he's inspired, I think he's a very inspiring character. I've even, it's even crossed my mind that he actually, like, if, if I, if I, like, he could be, either, he could be a Satoshi Nakamoto too, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ah, no, man. I'm, 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 nev- I'm never, I can see I think, it. just out of, no, dude. Okay. Oh, why? Think, well, like, well, just because he seems to be cool. like I, I've always felt uh, with Twitter that with Twitter he he is the visionary behind Twitter. Of mm-hmm. course, there were other founders, but from from what I've read, he was the visionary for that company and how it should look like and how it should be the characters and everything. And he had the money. 
He's yeah, and he he but he slowly like his power slowly got diminished because obviously you get shareholders and then you become a public company and then there's whole other like whole other eyes looking at you and also just um, you know there's surveillance trying to sneak through everywhere and advertisements. So I think he kind of lost control of Twitter. But you do see his stamp as in it never really got corrupted. Obviously, there's a lot of bots and there are scams going on, but it never really went full on exploited it. And I think that's kind of his, his finger, like the, the power he has left. It's kind of trying to prevent that. But um, mm-hmm. yes, it's, it's also he, um, he recently announced with Square because Square obviously does Bitcoin transactions and also uh, allows you to invest in Bitcoin. And has Bitcoin on his own uh, on his own balance sheet, but now they're working on a hardware solution, an open source hardware solution for Bitcoin, and preferably mobile. And they're open sourcing everything. So he open sourced the whole uh, the ideas that they have with the brainstorm session and the open invitation to anybody who wants to work on the project with him to send an inter- or to do an interview. So like all, all these little things are stacking up that he's um he's yeah he's becoming one of the most inspirational guys in tech i think for me at least he's moving in the right direction i think it's very interesting yeah i I agree i I always thought before i think six months ago like okay he's an evil dude or for whatever i didn't really know him but he's the ceo of twitter i didn't even know his ceo whatever you know he's in charge of twitter i don't like twitter all the censorship and shit and i was like okay fuck jack dorsey uh but then i think i saw his um podcast at the lex friedman podcast as well and he's actually quite a stoic dude. If you listen at how he uh, how he lives his life and he does OMAD, for example, he only eats once a day, that, that kind of stuff. I was like, okay. And he's sitting there completely like neutral and, and, and very stoic. I was like, okay, this is, he, he's making sense right now. And then I started doing a bit more research and the things he said about Bitcoin actually also made sense and he actually gets it. And then I saw, oh, he's actually promoting Bitcoin also on Twitter and with, with Square. So I, I agree that he is a very powerful player, if not the most powerful player right now. I don't know. I think uh, the people behind Binance uh, are way more powerful when it comes to, to crypto. But I do agree, like when it comes to public attention, He's he so far as I understood at least also from the interview he's definitely a very kind of a strong proponent. Uh, I'm very interested to see if he's actually going to turn out to be Satoshi Nakamoto. I don't I don't think uh, yeah, I I, don't, I really pre- preferred not to participate in any of those kind of. Yeah, but like people know him. I like this. Yeah. yeah but he is like uh, Zoe. He's he's a a familiar face within the current media. You know, he, he people know who he is. He is uh, an in group figure. And the, yeah. the people behind Binance, you know, who the fuck are the people behind Binance? People think they're just some I mean, cowboys. TZ. I don't know. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But the, 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 like in the West, to do it, it's it's very, you know, still, I don't know. I guess, I guess. I mean, he did have a, an interview with uh, Michael Saylor. But no, I mean, I know what you mean. He's by far not as public of a figure uh, as someone uh, like Jack Dorsey and represents, I guess, some of the ideals maybe even of the, kind of the Western uh, society uh, by the way i do i i remember now um it's funny but i there's two media um kind of uh, uh statements that i saw from the interview before i saw it and it was just very surprising to see how they just kind of blew up some of the uh, some of the things that were said in the interview is very typical media because i don't i don't think they, they said two things jack dorsey thinks bitcoin will bring world peace and jack dorsey wants to decentralize social media um, but in fact, at least how I interpret it is that what he said in the interview is that he would be um, he would be, say, open, potentially proponent of uh, advertisers paying in crypto. Um, and I think that was misinterpreted as, oh, we're going to decentralize social media completely. Uh, mm-hmm. And then um, there's the other uh, statement is that he did mean he did mention um, that he was um, yeah, like a believer in in peace and believed that if we fix the fundamental kind of lower layer of society being um, partially payments and the way that we transact with each other, right? Like on a more abstract level, just the way we exchange value. I think we've definitely touched upon this in previous podcasts um, in that what will happen is that the, the subsequent layers on, uh, uh, that, we're, that we're creating based on, for example, the financial system uh, are going to improve just by nature. And uh, yeah, I think for him, that was kind of leading to the conclusion of that's peace. And he did not mention peace, but it's funny how kind of, I think they twisted his words into decentralized social media, world peace. <laughs> it's more nuanced as usual. Yeah. 
Makes good sense. ideas. All right, so I should definitely watch that uh, that interview or that. Uh, I do recording. it. Yeah. All right. Uh, then there was uh, one other thing I actually wanted to um, to touch upon in this episode as well. We had a brief chat conversation before. Uh, the question that's on everyone's mind, at least in our chat groups, Telegram, Signal, WhatsApp, wherever we are, is are we still in a bear market or in a bull market or is it, this now a bear market? Have we entered a bear market? You said it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I know in which, which camp you are. So we have, I think, uh, Zoe is uh, team bear and you're, and I believe you are team bull. Um, I am a bit in between. I am still way more in the bull camp. But I'm curious to uh, to moderate what you guys have to say. Maybe you can go first, John. Are we still in the bull market? Uh, yeah, I think uh, it, it it really depends on the time horizon, though. If, if you'd say if you ask me for the next couple of weeks, past couple of weeks, like we've never been in a bear market for like a sh short term. But as um, the, the way I see it is, there's 2017. The prices shot up. Then 2018, everything crashed, and then it crashed for about three years. So that 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 was deep bear markets that 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 are the most recent one, but that's always also in most people's memory. So when you talk about the bear market, that's that's usually what I think of. Like that's my association is a three-year bear market where a lot of things get built, but almost nothing goes up. Like it's a there's just you know that everything just goes sideways except for the building and that that's basically that was the most interesting period to be investing and also in crypto because a lot of you you could see better and better what was being built and how it could actually provide value but there was no one investing yet so that was uh, in a, in a way i hope we're in a bear market but i think there's just too much happening there's um you see with axie infinity right so axie infinity is this um it's it's a fantasy game. It's play to earn, which is a new model which you get paid cryptocurrency or paid cryptocurrency if you actually play the game. You can collect and breed uh, fantasy creatures, and it's it's a fun game. But it's leveraging blockchain technology in a very cool way, and in such a cool way that actually a lot of people in the Philippines and other developing nations have been earning uh, have been earning a living wage from that, way above minimum wage in their own countries, especially with this price explosion, obviously. But is more, um, I like to use that as an example because there's so much cool stuff being created with NFTs and with DeFi and also with new concepts. So, you know, you know, completely new financial products or services or these games, and they're all blending together now. So you get NFTs with DeFi that can earn you cryptocurrency. And it's just the amount of experimentation is so much that I just can't imagine that there's not going to be a lot of cool action in the next couple of months from some projects with a new upgrade. Mm. And I think that, that 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 will keep people around. Whereas in 2018, 19, there wasn't much to stick around if you really weren't interested in the technology. But so, will this also affect the Bitcoin price? I think so. Because in the uh, in the end, it's um, a bull market is psychological, right? It's mass psychology. So a lot of people have to be enthusiastic and then greedy and then more greedy. <laughs> That's generally how it goes. That enthusiasm has just died out because it went a bit too far. You know, <laughs> definitely if you saw what was pumping and how hard it was pumping, like it, it overshot massively. But in the meantime, there's um, there, 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 there still hasn't been bad news for crypto like the past 12 months, if you really zoom out, it's um, a lot of billionaire investors and really prominent people are just positive. They're there. Uh, uh, Wozniak, the, the co-founder of Apple, call it a mathematical miracle. Uh, the, the third richest guy in Mexico called it, said uh, the dollar is a scam. Bitcoin is actually mathematical truth and can bring stability. It's it just keeps going. So all of these things, it's a, okay. So first, I, I don't think a, a bear market like we had before this bull market is, is possible because of the amount of innovation. And also, I, I think we just had to get rid of the excess, excess enthusiasm, like the irrational. Yeah, all the leverage. All the leverage, all the, the crazy ideas, all the people that think, you know, that, 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 that they're thinking that um, you could get rich without tangible or maybe not tangible because it's digital, right? But some kind of value like you have to create value and it has to be sustainable in order to create a cool product and a cool cryptocurrency and a lot of these things just weren't so it had to just the, the air had to come out but 
it, to me, it seems that, that that air has been out. A lot of people, you know, there could still be a crash down, a, a full-on capitulation, mostly because of the alts. You know, some alts are still dramatically overvalued for what they actually do and what they what they provide in terms of value. But yeah, I, 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 I don't see it happening. I, I don't see a very long extended bear market. So your case for a bull market is mainly fundamental, if I hear it correctly. This time around, yeah. For, for, for just, um, just another example, the, the Sandbox, which is a, a virtual reality project one of my favorite projects in the space, they just announced a partnership with the Walking Dead. So that's a brand coming to the metaverse. And you see that more and more that these companies are understanding the value of crypto and metaverses and NFTs. You know, if you look at the big brands, Warner Brothers just made a deal to release Warner Brothers NFTs. Um, I, I'm just waiting for Disney. I, like maybe they'll create their own one, but I it's, it's inevitable that all these big brands are going to go to NFTs. And that's the amount of value they can capture and then that, that's got to trickle down to the crypto economy for the rest, you know, because some of these people are going to take profits in Bitcoin. And then yeah. slowly, like it just, the, the whole crypto economy just like fundamentally becomes more valuable. Hmm. Very What's your opinion on that? So there's a lot to unpack there. Um, to start, I think what's really important in this whole debate is that we look at what question we're actually asking ourselves, right? So um, when it comes to, bear market what i'm saying is that okay so the, the definition of a bear market more or less is like for a period in say of say i, I looked it up just for uh, for fun's sake um, for a period of two plus months um in a market with multiple assets or crypto market as a whole you'll have a downturn of more than 20 percent. and i think we are not gonna see a shot up to what we were uh, to, to where we were in the next few weeks so by that definition i would say yes we're in a we're in a bear market um, and we're going to be in one. But that doesn't mean that the, um, what I also see, I, I'm a very big, big believer in cycles, right? So um, I kind of, uh, I don't believe in in isolated events, as in, you know, the, the kind of the physics uh, perspective of do we have particles or are there waves? Um, and I believe we're all dealing with waves. But what I also see is that as the, um, as the crypto ecosystem has grown, the complexity also increases, right? Um, and that means that you get diff different cycles. And I think we're just in a cyclical bear market, so to say. So that, that similarly to the one we had, uh, they're temporary. Uh, but also the correlation of the, uh, the kind of financial side of the crypto world. So the, the real market kind of trading a little bit closer to the TA, et cetera, um, is now deviating in terms of correlation from the actual uh, value that is added by the crypto ecosystem. So I think a lot of the things that you just said, Jorn, are, are completely true, and I agree. I feel that the uh, when it comes to the progress that we're making in the crypto world, so the fundamental sides of it, um, I think, are actually now slowly coming to a consolidation phase, which is actually extremely powerful. Right? So um, I, I feel that in, in markets, but in any form of, of, of innovation, you'll have cycles where you get like a lot of uh, divergence. So you get a, a, a lot of uh, complexity. Uh, there's a lot of solutions that solve the same problem with lo a lot of nuanced differences, uh, a lot of competition going on. And eventually you naturally need a consolidation, right? So you need to kind of converge again to a few things um, that uh, will form a new baseline for the next uh, the next phase of divergence and increased complexity. Um, I feel that with the interchain progress, the NFT progress, um, the uh, especially some of the uh, like kind of cross-chain DeFi things that are happening right now, um, and also uh, the fact that there's progress being made on, and there has to be a more conclusive debate on CBDC, so central bank digital currencies mm -hmm. and such, there is in the next, say, one to two years, so massive consolidation going to happen. And I feel that in turn, as a consequence of that, there will be um, a very, very strong bullish effect on the financial side. But I do feel that as those two markets are growing, right? Like when it comes to market cap, or I like the idea of realized uh, cap capitalization. So that's like, instead of we measure all the Bitcoin that there is, uh, kind of, for example, in, in the USD value, we look at the USD value of the Bitcoin since the last time it uh, moved a wallet. Um, so that you see kind of the activity um, reflected in the capitalization. Um, and then I feel that uh, it, it's quite quite interesting to look at as the complexity um, of the financial side. So when we look at market cap and we look at a, a lot of um, uh, kind of financial or uh, technical indicators um, that we see that 
it's grown so much that I think they're they're also diverging. So now when we say bear market, I mean only the financial side, and I'm not saying anything about the actual crypto developments that we're seeing. Um, so, and that makes me, on the one hand, makes it very hard to say anything about whether we're going to see price increase, uh, because that seems to correlate stronger with the media uh, and just, you know, really super subjective sentiment than real crypto developments. And I think as a conclusion, the uh, increase in price by far, and I think you also said it, Jordan, will be uh, influenced by a couple of factors. Um, but the closest one that we have, um, closest kind of to development of the cryptocurrency ecosystem is usability. If we have more usability, I think that's the first and best thing that we can get to, to influence the price from technical uh, product perspective. But for the rest, it's probably just media and FUD that will do the rest. But that's that's the feeling I have or, or you know, um, regulations. Okay, so, so to summarize it very briefly, so that a new, but I also understand it, you say we are in a bear market, but only from a price perspective. Yeah. That's it. That, that that's the very okay. okay. That's it. But then then you also say like you think in cycles. But it, if you do that, then right now we're breaking a very big trend in the sense that all the bull markets have and bear markets in the previous ten years have followed this four year pattern, and right now we're too early. So how do you see that? Yeah. So I, I um I was recently uh, diving into some notes of fooled by randomness. I know that you're a, a Taleb fan as well. Um, and I think what one of the takeaways I remember from that is that what's so interesting about the market is that the moment one part of the market sees a pattern and starts to act on it, they themselves are a pattern that another side of the market can act on. Right. So there's just uh, that's how the market consistently kind of um, reflects any change. So I feel that it, it will be, it will be in my eyes, and I'm not a trader, right? So I haven't participated for you know 10 years in the market, and, and I haven't seen hundreds of, of uh, bullish and bearish uh, swings. But I do, I do feel that it would be quite ridiculous, maybe, to assume that those cycles are going to continue in the same trend. Uh, a trend, considering the complexity of how markets work, um, it would actually, to me, make a lot more sense. Uh, to conclude that the the swings of the the bullish and bearish uh, markets are they're changing, so it could be that there's another four year trend, but I feel that we might be on a kind of a subtrend of the larger one or something yeah, along but, those lines. But the case is that it the trend is based on the supply, right? That's what Plan B says with the stock to flow model. So yeah, by definition, because the, that you have the happening, you can predict the general trend and in from that perspective it does make sense that the market will go on in that in that way sure but the 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 thing is like to, to tie to um i agree like you can look at that cycle but the thing is that i feel works better if the complexity of the system that you're trying to say anything about is lower so you know a few years back that might have been a better better model but by now we have so much more going on on the financial side, on the development side, that I think using only the uh, the stock to flow model of Bitcoin, which is you know just one, even though the largest, but still only one currency, um, is slowly losing its 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 value in that sense because there's just so many variables introduced every single month in the crypto world. True, but the only thing is what, um, what what keeps happening is that most people in the space, because there, there's most money is still speculative. Like even what I said with Axie Infinity, of course, the price sh shoots up and the price shoots up because of fundamentals, because um, Axie Infinity uh, turned out a killer revenue in a week. So it's based on fundamentals, but still it's a lot of speculative value. Like it shot up to $30 and then it went down to $14 again. You can see, you know, there's still still the crypto thing is going down. And I feel like that's the, um, an important part of that is, is because most people take profits in Bitcoin. Like their goal with altcoins is to accumulate Bitcoin. So if Bitcoin goes down, that means that all your altcoins just became worth more Bitcoin, which is uh, the goal for most people. So what do you do? You start selling because you, took a pro you made a profit in Bitcoin. And that's why I think Bitcoin's dominance is still so incredibly strong. Because that's that's what's keep keep on happening, right? If Bitcoin drops twenty percent and your coin doubles, then you just made a lot of Bitcoin. Like, are you gonna sit on that? Are you just gonna hope it will keep outperforming Bitcoin, or you you take profits in Bitcoin? 
Is that a question to me? No, it's just, uh, I, I'm just, uh, this is uh, this is a pattern that I've been seeing a lot in crypto. And it's just, um, to, to play in what you were saying is that Bitcoin's influence might still be outsized for a very long time. Because yeah. I was thinking about, like, I, I agree. And also what I, what I said, you know, that there's a lot more innovation going on. So individual projects can go up for sure. But if Bitcoin, like if there's very bad news surrounding Bitcoin and very negative sentiment, it will still pull the crypto market down in the same way yep. it has always does for now. I mean, it seems like the, the focal point is just Bitcoin, right? So um, the, the price increases or kind of momentum increases of smaller projects will still be relative kind of to the trend that Bitcoin pushes the market to. Um, but there are still a lot of projects, I think, also that are outperforming Bitcoin in that sense. Uh, so you'll you'll still see that if you invest in those right now, even though when you compare it to a few months back, it's still a lot a lot of loss that you've you've had. Um, the trends that you can follow now, will eventually, once everything shot, shoots up again, will still have earned you a lot of money in retrospect. Um, so yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I do wonder. I do wonder. Like that, that's that's such a big point right now. Is how long and how strong will that dominance still remain? The Bitcoin dominance. It's it's it's. I I I think it will never disappear, because if you think about it, like um, the dollar isn't volatile or the euro, right? But our goal with investing, especially if you're more on the risk curve, your goal is to make a lot of money. So you cash it out in dollars, but. If Bitcoin is gradually becoming the form of money, then that becomes the unit of account for your investments, especially your crypto investments. So the, then, the, then um, everything is volatile in terms of Bitcoin, ex, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of dollars, but not in Bitcoin because Bitcoin will sort of stabilize the rest. Mm, yeah. so Bitcoin itself will remain super volatile. So then it it like it it sort of logically has to remain has to keep this outsized influence because the, nothing can influence the price of the dollar, right? Because it's, it's not if there's a media attention for the dollar, the dollar is not going to fucking trip, sorry, <laughs> triple, in a, triple in a couple of months. Well, at this point, I'm not surprised at anything anymore, but um, <laughs> no, true, I but, think we can, we can uh, fund the dollar. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It, it's I think pretty we, uh, much a shit coin, but okay. It is pretty much a shitcoin. That's absolutely true. When you look at kind of the properties of the dollar, it's infinite dollar. supply. <laughs> They're terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Super centralized. Yeah. Wasn't it? Uh, wasn't it Eric Wall that tweeted that? Uh, I think he uh, or some 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 dude that tweeted in, indeed, like with a couple of indicators how much of a shitcoin the USD is. But um, yeah. I, I mean, I totally agree. Like, it, it. I think we spoke about this in one of the other episodes as well. That um, and and we were very much aligned. I feel on. The fact that the Bitcoin dominance has good reasons to be there and probably also to to exist, but I still, you know, do you feel that say ten or fifteen years from now, like I, I don't think there's a lot of doubt that three to five years from now Bitcoin's still going to be dominant. Ten to fifteen years is a long time, and I feel that even though yes, um, we I, w I would not assume that the coming years Ethereum, for example, will become such a focal point in in the uh, the crypto industry. Um, on the other hand, I don't know. I, I feel that if for Bitcoin to become a unit of account, it will need some of the other properties as well. So store value, uh, it, it will probably cover. But then medium of exchange, I'm not so sure. Like, for example, the fact that I use Euro generally or USD as unit of account to, to measure my portfolio, for example, um, is because it is the most sticky say concept I have right now because it's yeah. my medium of exchange, right? So I, I feel that for for that to actually work, Bitcoin might have to adopt slightly more medium of exchange kind of properties, which it might, but I, I think unit of account, like an actual unit of account, will become really, really hard because then it has to stabilize, which it oh. it's, it won't. And I think that's also one of Taleb's main arguments, which, you know, it's a completely valid argument, but it's a scarce store of value. So it's, it, it doesn't really. Just for clarification, can, can you define unit of account? A unit of account is basically the, the, the price signal. So that you can say, okay, this is three dollars. This uh, this this uh, labor is fifteen dollars an hour. That that's just the price signal of uh, that you can measure everything in. And Bitcoin is you can measure in satoshis because they are a small unit, 
but it's very difficult to keep track of the prices if they fluctuate uh, <laughs> a couple of a couple of percentages per day sometimes. So that's yeah. that's that's why it can't really be a unit of account. However, it already is the unit of account of the crypto industry. Ethereum, but, but will it ever become the unit of account of the general public? That's the main question. Depends on many. Like that's again, okay, that, that, that's that's that, that that really depends on how this all how this is all going to evolve. I, I do imagine because just of the efficiencies of blockchain technology itself, that a lot of value will uh, naturally go to the blockchain. I think it will start with a lot of untapped sources of value. You see it with NFTs, you know, like a, a creative expression or artists that didn't know how to monetize their work, and it's just becoming more and more creative. I, I read this. I just want to sell this because it's way too cool. I just read this uh, this article that allows you to invest through a DAO in medical patents. So you can invest directly in research for any disease you want or you support that there has to be research. You fund it. If they create patents, the patents become owned by the DAO. And then it can be commercialized like that. So they open, like economically, completely open the medicinal patents. Whoa. And the, those are things, you know, like you just see that in every area, there's so much going on with NFTs and DeFi that I think slowly uh, value will just naturally go to the blockchain because of that. And then more traditional assets, we come to the blockchain. And then slowly, if, if the if fiat currencies really are going to lose 20 to 30 percent per year, which it unfortunately does look like. In a, that, that, that it will just happen for a couple of years, maybe not the whole time, but it, it does look pretty bad. Then maybe, yeah, maybe Bitcoin naturally becomes a unit of account for everything that's on the blockchain and slowly everything becomes on the blockchain. That was interesting. I, I feel that... Uh, go ahead, Niels. No, no, sorry. I, I just wanted to say like, okay, okay I, I can see that happening from a technological perspective for sure. But Zoe briefly mentioned just now the central bank digital currency. I think that that will be pushed tremendously in the coming years to come. And I'm not sure if Bitcoin is going to be this unit of account for the, for the mainstream public, right? They, they, they weren't going to allow it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a massive hurdle to hook into that. Exactly. My thought was as well that it, it I mean, it seems to me when I look at kind of the, the, the patterns um, that there's a lot of reason a lot of incentive for central banks and, and governments and such to keep pushing for this medium of exchange role because that's going to give them what they keep repeating they want, right? That's just, they want complete, it's ridiculous, but they want to have complete observability. They want to be able to track everyone and, you know, see if, what's going on. I just, I can't for the life of me uh, understand why well, that would ever be a good idea. But um, then it does seem like as more people get into crypto, um, and and it you know we distribute it properly to people that are unbanked and like you know the, the billions of people that are um, in uh, in regimes that they will start indeed I hope as well uh, accumulate Bitcoin and that will be the store of value that they'll use right so in in that sense there's kind of maybe it's going to be a split um, as in your savings or your say ah your spending power you will kind of denominate that in Bitcoin so it's 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 not really the unit of account for what you would buy stuff with, but at the very least, you were able to say like, oh, okay, you know, I hold a half a Bitcoin and that's, that's, that's great. And that will, uh, even though it fluctuates, that's kind of how I measure my wealth. And on the other hand, um, perhaps the unit of account in, in most cases that we use for day-to-day -day life will still be a, a central bank digital currency, simply because all the governments are across the world, or you know, because of Forex as well, um, are going to try to stabilize that really intensively to make sure that the um, uh, uh, the demand and the export, like the, the value that we can produce in countries, um, is actually aligned properly with what we use as unit as units of account. And I think there's a really important role to play in that there's a strong relation between um, the the ways that governments control uh, the. Uh, uh, what is the production again of, of a country? Uh, uh, GDP. Thank you, GDP. Um, they, they control that a lot. And I think there's, a, there's an important role to play for governments there as well, right? So I think it's going to be hard to kind of replace that aspect with the cryptocurrency, um, but it, the, the role just might be divided. No, but we, we won't use... if, if, hang on, to summarize really, really briefly that, you think that they can coexist? That's your assumption in there. 
I think I think that it's quite likely that they will. As in, I will hold mostly crypto uh, as, as I do now, but then I will spend my money in something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I, that doesn't seem very plausible to me that they're gonna allow they the, the the ones with power to they want to have a currency where they can track everything and control what you're spending, right? And they're well, gonna allow to... at the same time Bitcoin, like the the antithesis of that. That's not really plausible right i don't i don't know i don't think it's i don't think it's a story of allowing i think i think there's a limit to what they can control in that sense um they have they can... the monopoly of violence good point i don't know how far that's i mean if yeah if we're going to bring that into the the discussion i think I, i'm not so sure if that's actually but... going to play out as you might expect on a global level there might be some issues there will probably be some issues but i don't know eventually what we'll kind of settle to whether it's going to be that heavily influenced by governments com seizing complete control in a unified effort uh, to make everything uh, go along with their currency. I feel that as long as they can measure all transactions, because that's literally the most interesting part, right? What do you spend your money on? Uh, and they will be able to control that because they control all the enterprises. Um, they will control a large portion of uh, they still control taxes. Like there's a lot of levers that they can pull to force us to use their currency. Like there's a lot of levers that they can and will absolutely pull to, to, to force us to do that. But they cannot force you to store your funds in a particular way. Well, one, yeah, one lever is to ban Bitcoin, but uh, okay. Yeah, but they, okay. <laughs> it's, it's, Sorry, it's, 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 it's just uh, like what always, I, I think we touched upon this this last, last episode as well, but we still live in democracies. That, well, that, yeah. that, that, that that's that that's what's well yeah, i i know like that's what you think right but <laughs> think. not so much anymore like how, when did we ever and then this is coming down like I, I think bitcoin is just a better form of money so i think democratically a lot of people like now it's still pretty niche like a lot of people just still don't get the whole sound money narrative it's more get rich quick scheme right but at some point people will naturally want bitcoin and gravitate towards it because of the inflation protective assets that it, it it actually has because of its scarcity and then just this whole discussion is kind of scary that we actually have to talk about like how how govern like we live in a democracy right like when did we ever choose to have total surveillance money like yeah. when, was that, when, when, when were we ever at <laughs> that's the whole point but, but there is a breaking point that's kind of where i'm trying to get at that there there is a breaking point and you see it a, a lot of like with this covid restrictions already hitting like the, the governments are hitting a wall right to what they can push and what they can't in some countries not everywhere but the, there's got to be a breaking point with this as well right that they just yeah okay, but okay, we will okay. we'll swallow your golf coins but you gotta Ooh. allow to protect ourselves from those the, the, the downsides as well I don't know, because I'm also very surprised how far we already have got them right now. And people are just allowing it. They're just like, yeah, sure, you know, let's go. Like, I would have imagined already, right, that this would be too far, where the, the point in history where we are right now. But people yeah. are just okay with it. So it goes slowly. It's like a frog in a, in a boiling water, just like it's fine, you know, it's okay. And at one point, you're in a socialist state, and then, fuck, where's my money? So yeah. I'm not sure if, if that, that point comes that, that you... The claim will come. Okay, here's enough. But there's millions of hodlers around the world. There's not a couple of million. There's, uh, I read the stats. It's the, the, the estimates are about uh, 200 million, the 300 million people now that hold Bitcoin. That's, that's not negligible anymore. You know, that will spread. And especially if it maintains the hold value in chaos, which in that, like it should become worth more even on the peer to peer market because it protects your life force like it protects the value you've created with your energy and that, that's like that's what you want to do and at some point like, i was talking to this friend of mine like in lebanon the, the currency crashed which is horrible for the country like the country is getting getting destroyed right now and it's crazy to think because for us it's not like it's unimaginable at this stage but it's crazy to think that your national currency is more volatile than bitcoin like yeah. it lost it lost like 90 percent in 10 years then a 50 percent drop in a couple of weeks after a 10 10x run-up doesn't sound so bad anymore and the more these fiat currencies are gonna shake which they are the more Bitcoin is like, okay, I can lose 40% in a couple of months. I've lost 99% last year, you know? 
Yeah, but I think that history also shows that even in socialist countries, there was also always a dual society. So there was like the state money and also then people were like secretly doing other stuff. And I think this, this story in Argentina where they buried silver in the garden, but they also buried a fake silver spot in the garden. So if the government would get it, they would have a fake silver spot. So my point is more, I want to prevent us going in that direction. And I'm kind of worried right now that we will go into that direction with crypto. Or shouldn't I be? Well, you mean that it gets banned that that harshly? Yeah. Yeah. I, it's it's like, I, I still, I thought like, you see all the writings on the wall. Like, I, I agree, but I just, uh, I don't know. Like, you see the narrative changing from um, from also the, the, the financial authorities is the narrative is changing towards, okay, now it's becoming a financial risk. Like, now we're really going to regulate it and stable coins. And, you know, it's... It, it all, it all, it, it's all true. I just think that um, having an, a, a, from a systems perspective... A homogenous system is not possible. This is not possible. So having having one like like binary, you know, like this is the money we're using, it's, it's not it's not going to work. And exactly like you said, like people bury their silver or fake silver. We've always had cash. I think I feel that it's impossible, just um, from a from a kind of yeah, philosophical but also systems perspective, to have one system only that like operates on one. Kind of layer and there's no deviations from it if that were possible it would be so ridiculously hard to maintain like absurdly hard the amount of violence that would be needed for that is is unimaginable i think you know we I have agree. to think like further than world war ii it's unimaginable what kind of violence you need to sustain something like that and i think just by uh by definition that system would be doomed to collapse extremely fast so I feel that it, it's such a, um, it's a very fatalistic. Of, sorry to interrupt, but what sort of system are you, are you talking about? Yeah, well, I'm talking about, I think what Niels is hinting towards is a situation where there's literally enforcement from governments uh, to uh, create one kind of system for, for any exchange of, of, of value or energy, maybe. Uh, Communism. Um, that they, yeah, that they control. Um, the thing is, I also feel like, for example, communism has never, uh, in all the countries that have implemented it, never it has fully never been... real communism. Exactly. There, yeah, it's just not, okay. And I think it, that's never going to work like that, right? So what will happen is, I think, and that's why I think they'll be, they will coexist. There has to be, there's always a point where, because it's just checks and balances, it's risk reward, where the communist uh, idealists are saying like, uh, okay, th it's not worth it anymore. This is not worth it anymore. Yeah, to... Okay, so I fully agree. And we're also right. not we're not living in a real capitalist society, like in the purest essence of capitalism. So you can debate on that. I think that yeah. that perfectionist idea is impossible to achieve in, in real life. But the point is more absolute power, I think corrupts absolutely, as you also believe. And people in power are always gonna try to get there some way. It, it, it just history shows that. So along the way, there will be this, this, this punishment for people that, try to escape it and in the end it will all be right and it will be a new eruption of a new system but it's not going to mean there's no pain in between true yeah, okay that's true i fully agree with you on that there's like it's th it's time to step on the brakes pretty hard by now yeah uh, I, yeah yeah that's true yeah yeah definitely but yeah it's uh, <laughs> it's definitely pushing towards a direction but that's um, that, that's the beauty of bitcoin in the end isn't it it's it's non-violent and it's unconfiscatable. You don't have to hide it anywhere. You can, you can just memorize the private key. Yeah, that's from a technology. Uh, yeah, just technology perspective, it, it's it's so amazing. I I still every day I'm starting to realize more like how insane of an just an ID Bitcoin is. That it, but it's, yeah, it it's, just it's, blows it's, my it's mind. It's it's funny that you mentioned communism. Like it 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 does like the, the the slogans. You know, you own nothing and you'll be happy, and we'll have one one super surveillance golf coin. Like yeah, that doesn't sound too promising, no. But then <laughs> then Bitcoin is like it is an extreme force for capitalism. Yeah, it, yeah, in, in a sense it is. Yeah, just individualism. It's, just it, it's like... it's actually in the rugged individualism, absolutely, and it's it's. 
it's exactly almost exactly the opposite of what a lot of forces are trying to push for now yeah and that's also exactly why i just cannot believe it, it's gonna be peaceful like it's so it, like it, from it, an... it, it, it can't be peaceful. Nah, have you read the fourth turning no i haven't it's a very interesting book um it's it's i i think together with the sovereign individual i think it's the both of those books are best at predicting what, what's happening and also with historical evidence and the fourth turning basically says society is like a human life. It, it has also has generations and phases in life. So you have childhood, uh, adolescence, uh, adulthood, and then uh, old age. And it says it does the same thing. And you have four different generations that also all, like start conflicting more and more with each other. So we started after the Second World War, and that affected the generation. And how that generation grew up affected the next generation. And then after 80, 90 years, the system stops working because it too much has changed. The societal corpus has just has moved on, but the institutions don't get along. And it describes exactly that. And then if you combine it with the sovereign individual, that the, the internet has just uh, dis disrupted everything in a way that's unsustainable now. It's that, yeah, it has to... Uh, it has to, it ha there has to be a massive shock to the system. And what you said, Niels, those in power are not going to give it away. They're not no. going to be like, oh, we get it. We were wrong. Here you go, guys. Here are the keys to everything. Yeah, I agree. I see yeah. Zoe thinking really hard. So I'm, I'm curious to see what he thinks of this. Yeah, yeah, no, you're, you're right. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be a fight for sure. It's just, I don't know how, how bad the fight's going to be. And that's just the hardest thing to uh, to judge. And I, I feel that, you know, from dealing with the compliance side of, of, of things slightly more, uh, I do feel that that fight's going to be pretty hard and it's, it's being fought already pretty hard. Um, I, I just think that... I don't know where the, uh, the, the limit is, right? Like in any system, what I believe, I think we mentioned it before as well, it's like what, what is not being used um, will naturally degrade and eventually die out. And what the internet caused is that a lot of the infrastructure that we relied on from governments um, has actually just been replaced by the internet. Um, so they already lost a lot of power there and I think they didn't even notice it, um, especially because they're so late with all the digital transformation and such. Um, it has had a huge impact. So in that sense, I think the power, it's hard to get an idea for like how the powers are actually um, shifted right now. Where is the real, where's, where is the most power really? And that's just, I, f I find it so difficult to get a good grasp of that. Because on the one hand, governments can make moves where you're like, oh, they have a lot of power. But on the other hand, the fact that we have the internet, which, which allows us to communicate, but also consistently evolve to find countermeasures against whatever the government's trying to do, uh, like cryptographically and such, uh, is, is so extremely powerful that sometimes I, I am also surprised by how powerful it actually is. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I don't know where, where it's going to be that, like, um, you know, that cutting point. But I don't know you, if you guys... You, you know, so it's 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 funny what you're saying. Like, I, I, I always imagine forces. Like, I even give them different colors. But if I look at power and how it's distributed, I just see, uh, see forces. I see the government as a force. I see the elite as a force. And I don't see any individual. Like, I don't see, you know, like an old boys meeting with, with cigars. Like, haha, which country are we mm. going to take over? Like, obviously, there, there are calls being made like that. But I think in general, it's aligned interest. And it's it's the the the, the, the yeah the, the violence like the monopoly of violence you have behind you, but also um, I think that's where the friction is. When do when when do the little guys become aware that together they stand stronger than the ones with the monopoly on violence? And how is that transition going to happen? And also with the, the aligned interest, like when when is the breaking point that their power doesn't that their power breaks down because people are just becoming disobedient. Yeah. yeah, that That's like what I'm wondering every day. Like when do people say this is enough? It's, and in, in they, France, you see it, right? In France, like there are like riots and the yellow uh, fests, how do they call it in, in English? I don't, don't really know, but this, yeah, there you can see people are getting crazy. But here where I'm right now, I'm in the Netherlands that it's not, it's like, you know, it's okay. It has uh, yeah, to become unbearable. Like, that's what Ray Dalio says. At some, at some point, like, there's two things that pushes a society to violence. That's when become a situation becomes unbearable or when one's core values are being taken away or there's a threat to one's core values that 
that determine what you value in life or not. It was interesting. What I think you're hinting at as well, Niels, is this, um, what do you call it again? Learned helplessness is kind of a thing, right? So you can, um, this this whole point at which things become unbearable is something that you can actually strategically move as well. So yeah. I think I think that's what they're doing. Like you can teach, for example, I think there was an experiment where you get a dog on a, uh, on a plate that shocks it. Um, but by uh, eventually the dog would get used to that and would just automatically like as habitually be okay with being shocked uh, even though you would imagine that that's just nuts right and, and people are I think the same so if you do it really gradually they're going to get a, a really uh, like pretty far and I feel that the media I just thought about it a little bit like I think the media is, is, is going to be more important and I think the reason also for example uh, uh, you know, Balaji, the ex-CTO of, uh, of Coinbase, has a really yeah. interesting podcast with Tim Ferriss. I think you recommended it to me, Niels. Um, yeah. There's many, many people, uh, I think Peter Thiel also has mentioned this before, is that journalism, like the spread of information and reporting of what's happening, might be one of the catalysts for, for the radical change that we're talking about now, either to the good or the bad side. Who controls that? How do, how do we distribute ideas? Because that's going to make people decide what is unbearable and what not. What are what is my value? What do I believe in? All that stuff. Uh, propaganda is still a thing. And uh, yeah, how do we? How do we I I, that? I just feel that there is so much just internal conflict between groups right now that it's and that's also a good power play, you know, divide and conquer. Because how are we ever going to unite? I don't even see it. I, I don't think we can even find some core values short term like this is so weird because the, the the people that are fighting they say this is you know this is going too far this is against our freedom those are now extreme right it's it's so weird it's the whole dynamic it's you know it's yeah it's almost you shared like, yeah sorry no sorry go ahead finish your thought no you you made the the dog example uh uh I think there's also the, the frog example, right? The boiling frog. If you throw it in the water, then it, it jumps out. But if you boil it when it's sitting in, in the water, it will just die. And I kind of feel that we're doing that on a, on a collective scale right now. That we're, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. But you know, I, I think the water is actually inflation. Have you ever? Mm. Uh... <laughs> no, nah, it's it's <laughs> because it's so insi it's so insidious. Like it's so sneaky inflation. If you haven't studied economics or monetary history or how money works, which is 90, 90 plus percent of the world, you're being taxed in a way that you don't understand. And with the distortions that causes, that's, the, the, that's exactly how I see what's being boiled right now. And the unbearable point becomes what you see in France. They, what do they do? They raise gas prices by 10 cents. That's it. But that 10 cents is the drop. Like that's exactly when people start feeling the boiling water because for 20, 30 years, cost of living has gone up, but their wages haven't been rising enough. New homes have been going up, but incomes haven't been rising enough. So gradually society has started to feel the effects of money printing, which has been going on for 50 years. But you can't really observe it. You can't, like, you become very immune if you see the inflation report, you know, the national inflation, like this year there was 1%, 2% inflation. You don't care about those 2%. But it adds up. And especially if the money, like, um, you have the cantillion effect. So, man, especially if the money gets clogged up at the top, at the elite, and at the people that already own assets, which has happened exactly, and is happening especially the past 18 months in a very, very in, uh, unequal way. It's that that's that's when it starts boiling. And what I feel is that we've reached that boiling point. Like we've been boiling, like boiling the water through inflation for 50 years. And this this is the point where it's becoming unbearable. And the same in South Africa. Like mm -hmm. there's this saying that every social problem is an economic problem in disguise. And it's it's yeah. not for it's it's not for it's for a good reason that there's you know, even pre-corona, there was already Brexit and Trump, but it's all just I, to me personally, I, I think they're all related. And I think they're all related to the money printing and pe taking people's dignity and bad, like just disbalancing the economic system of resource allocation. Yeah, maybe you know this, but uh, I think there's a theory that states that uh, a society can only be in balance if like the uh, elite has a certain percentage and the middle class has a certain percentage. But as soon as the, the elite gets too much, then social conflict will erupt and you that's what you 
see right now in Africa, you know, Black Lives Matter riots, you, you see within society, the, the conflicts are coming. So basically, this is just a sign that it's an economical problem, is what you're saying as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. It's, uh, it's, it's just for me, but I, I'm obviously biased, you know, I'm obviously from the Bitcoin angle, but it's, it's I, I've tried to destroy my own bias as much as I can, you know, to get exactly the opposite, opposite view. And it just, the opposite view is modern, um, uh, modern monetary theory. And that's just, that's made up nonsense. That's absolute ridiculous. That's like Star Wars. That's the dumbest thing economically you can do. Like you just can't do that. They just made shit up to make it seem better. Uh, I love that a Bitcoin guy is uh, saying it's Star Wars to, <laughs> to the traditional <laughs> <Yeah>. view. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. All right. Um, I think we covered a lot. I, there was what one point on my list, maybe to end with some positive news. Um, you wanted to raise that, Jorn, I think, about... I, I even forgot the name. I written down Kid and Money. So maybe you can tell me a bit more about that. <laughs> about what? Kid and Money. Infinity. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's oh, yeah. I think, I think we already discussed it, right? Okay. Really, did we about the kittens? I, I didn't. Yeah, get yeah. Like, I, I uh, what I said to Zoe as well. I, I, I didn't play the game that much. Like I just br briefly, uh, briefly looked at it. It's just, uh, it's, it's mostly that as a signal that not everything is one on one correlated, and there's still a lot of opportunities out there. Okay. Well, I think yeah. that's a, a very positive yeah, I, note. <laughs> I, I, st I started to become an, uh, an NFT hunter. Like I'm curating art now in the evening. Yeah, really. Yeah, 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 I go to OpenSea or Rarible, and I just look at all these art pieces, and there's really cool stuff. Like there's uh, there's people like doing really really cool. I, I just bought uh, yesterday about face art. That's that's an artist I discovered on OpenSea, mm -hmm. and she she makes very very artsy faces. So she uses paintings to make faces of people that are dead to come alive. And you got Mohammed Gandhi, you got uh, Beethoven, you got a lot of artists, but. It's just that's the tip of the iceberg because there's there's millions of NFTs. So I, I think, uh, yeah. What is OpenSea, by the way? Is that a platform for this? It's a marketplace. It's like eBay for NFTs. What's the URL? I can't find it. OpenSea.io. I'm, I'm actually curious to see this. Yeah, it's 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 fun. Like it's really cool. I I, I think uh, like after the summer, obviously uh, I'm gonna take a <laughs> well-deserved holiday in nature, but. Um, after that, I really, uh, I really want to scout more NFTs. I think there's really something to it because also you can program this. So you got programmable art. So you got, uh, you can do some DeFi things with it. You know, like yield farming and liquidity providing with NFTs. And yeah. So you're saying that these are all NFTs, these this artists, and they make money from this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like so, yeah. some do, obviously. Like people, <laughs> okay, yeah. the, the, the people made a hundred million like dollars. <laughs> Let's, uh, let's draw something, right? I got a really cool idea for uh, for an NFT game. Okay, what's that? It's called Crazy Karens. And it's an NFT game with based on collectibles and Karens are taking over the world and our token holders have to defend the world from the Karens. Space Karens. All right. All right. I think uh, if someone listens right now and thinks I want to invest in this stuff, then uh, they have your email uh, newsletter. They can reply to that. <laughs> Other than that, I think this is a perfect uh, one to, to wrap it up. Uh, thanks, guys, again. Um, actually, I learned a lot this time, uh, as always, but especially about the Zoe's view on the whole system theory and why things were in a bear market. That uh, is really interesting. Um, and yeah, you as well. You're great stuff. Um, so yeah. thanks. And... Yeah, I will see you uh, in the next crypto scene. It's yeah, Zoe. I'm gonna. I'd, I'd love to learn more what Niels was saying. Like mind blown by the, the system, like the, the way you explain it and the way how these systems work and boil down the complexity. And there's yeah, just it, oh, it, can, it, uh... it applies so well to the crypto market. Like you see, it's it's sort of Darwinism, and then this whole system just you you see it evolving and growing complexity and then stagnating. Maybe we should it's do crazy, that next time. Right? We can do that. Yeah, yeah. I'll uh, send you over a, a few uh, like articles and books as well. We can maybe post that somewhere in the in the comments. 
uh, for uh, for system stuff. Um, and I'm definitely going to look into the NFTs and Axie as well because I haven't looked in it, into it nearly as much as I should. Sandbox. But, uh, that that's my biggest NFT virtual reality tip right now. Sandbox. sandbox. All right. Yeah. To be All continued. Right. Awesome. Okay, sandbox guys, buy some now, and uh, we'll see you in the next episode. <laughs> Yo, see you. Yo, ciao.